Well, it's just so good to be with all of you. Are y'all ready to hear the word this morning? Come on, did y'all enter in to worship this morning? I know at 9 o'clock it was so good just to just go right on into the presence of the Lord. And so we're going to just dive into his word. Let's go before him in prayer. Father God, I just thank you, Lord, for your word. I thank you, Lord, that your word is true. I thank you, Lord, that your word would just pierce our hearts today, Lord. Let it bring revelation. Uh, let it bring understanding. Let it bring insight, Lord, that we can take and go forth from this place to do all that you've called us to do, to, to see our communities, our families, our neighbors, our friends uh, come to know you, come to encounter the presence of Jesus that sets people free and changes lives and brings healing and deliverance. We thank you, God, uh, for today, Lord, and we just give you glory. Glory and honor in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Praise the Lord. This is my third time to preach this, and so it should, I think I got it by now. Praise the Lord. Amen. Uh, Hebrews chapter 4. I want to talk to you about prayer this morning. Prayer is something that I'm very passionate about. It's something that our church uh, in Liberty really focuses on, on being a house of prayer, being a people of prayer. And I know that this house believes in prayer, believes in seeing God move. You want to see your community change. You want to see your community shaken. I see all the different Jesus shirts around. It makes me feel at home because we've been a part of that now and just jumped on your bandwagon for the past few years. And so those you go to Walmart in Liberty, Texas, and you're probably going to see a Jesus shirt there somewhere. Praise the Lord. So, amen. So let's look at the word in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 14. It says, seeing then that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. Come on, we have a great high priest. His name is Jesus. Come on, we don't have an earthly high priest. We have a great high priest whose name is Jesus, who has went to heaven, who is seated at the right hand of the throne of God, who forever makes intercession for us, whose blood cleanses and washes and sets us free and has brought healing and deliverance to you and to me. Amen? Amen. Come on, we got a great high priest. Come on, we have a great high priest. His name is Jesus. Verse 15 says, we don't have a high priest who cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet was without sin. Come on, Jesus can understand what you're going through. Come on, Jesus went through a lot of stuff in his life. Come on, you know he had loved ones die? Come on, Jesus had loved ones die. He had family members that died while he was there. He, he dealt with grief. He dealt with pain. He dealt with rejection. He dealt with all those things, but he was without sin. Come on, we have a great high priest. So since we have such a great high priest, verse 16 says, Let us therefore come boldly into the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in our time of need. Come on, let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace, not timidly, not fearfully, not tiptoeing in, afraid you're going to upset him. Come boldly before the throne of grace. Why? Because we have a great high priest. He's already there. Come on, he's already there and he's made a way for you and I to come boldly that we may what? That we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in our time of need. The voice translation says verse 16 this way. It says, so let us step boldly to the throne of grace where we can find mercy and grace to help when we need it most. Come on, I don't know about you, but I need God's mercy and I need God's grace. I need it. I need it. Like, come on, I don't just want it. I need it. I need his grace. I need his favor. I need his strength. I need his wisdom. I need his mercy. Come on, you, we, anybody in here not made a mistake? Come on, then, then you need his mercy. Come on, we've all made mistakes. We've all got shortcomings. We've all failed. We've all fallen on our face. And there is mercy available to us if we will come boldly before the throne of grace that he has made available to us. In Hebrews chapter 1, it says that God, who at sundry times and in divers manners spoke in past unto the fathers by the prophets, having these last days spoken unto us by his son. Come on. God has spoken to us by Jesus. Come on. Jesus is the message of the father. Jesus is the representation. He is the image of the father. And he has come. And he's been made our high priest. Now in verse 8, God says to Jesus, look at this. But unto the Son, he says, Your throne, O God, is forever, and a scepter of righteousness is the scepter of your kingdom. 
Come on. The scepter of his kingdom is a scepter of righteousness. When I read that verse, it always takes me back to the story of Esther. Set that story up for those of you who might not be familiar. Esther's been made king, uh, made queen. She's married to the king of Persia. And there is a plot to exterminate, to annihilate, a genocide to kill and slaughter every Jew in Persia. Okay, And so Esther is informed of this plot. Her uncle Mordecai tells her, you need to go before the king and intercede and stand on our behalf and say something. You need to do something. You're the one who has the ability. And Esther, like a lot of us, you know, a lot of times we can be very self-serving. Very protective, very afraid of risking our own pride, our own ego, what might happen. And she's like, no, no, Mordecai, you don't understand. I haven't been summoned by the king in over 30 days. And if I go before the king unbidden and he doesn't extend his scepter to me, I will be put to death. Mordecai tells her it's time to grow up. It's time to make your decision. What are you going to do? That's my translation. All right. And so she goes, she fasts and she prays for three days with all her handmaidens. And she goes before the king. And in Esther 5, 2, it says this. And it was so when the king saw Esther, the queen, standing in the court, that she obtained favor in his sight. And the king held out to Esther the golden scepter that was in his hand. And Esther drew near and touched the top of the scepter. So she found favor in the sight of the king, and he extended the scepter. And because of what Jesus has done, you and I have found favor in the sight of God. And his scepter of righteousness is extended to all who will boldly come before his throne. Come on. Come on. The scepter of righteousness is permanently and perpetually extended as an offer to you and to me that if you will accept the blood of Jesus, you can come boldly before the throne of grace and cry out for grace and mercy when you need it most. Come on. You don't have to wait till Sunday to come boldly before the throne of grace and be like, Lord, I need mercy. I need grace this morning. Come on, this idea of prayer is that we go into the presence of God because he wants to send us out with something. So that what I want to talk to you today about prayer is about this idea of an in and out lifestyle, coming into the presence of God and then going out to our community, coming into the throne room of God and saying, God, I need grace, I need mercy, and then going out to your world, to your job, to your neighborhood, to your family. Come on, I don't live in Galveston. I live in Liberty. You know, but for you, it's going out to the island with the light of Jesus, with the mercy of God, with the grace of God. But you got to come in to the throne room. And come on, that way has been opened wide up by the blood of Jesus. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of your kingdom. Hebrews chapter 6, verse 19, continuing there, this idea says, Now we have this hope. As a sure and a steadfast anchor of the soul. It cannot slip and it cannot break. Under whosoever steps out upon it. Oh a hope that reaches farther. And enters into the very certainty of the presence within the veil. Where Jesus has entered in for us in advance. A forerunner having become a high priest forever. After the order of Melchizedek. Come on we have this hope. We have this righteousness, this gift, this hope in the gospel, in the goodness of God, in the forgiveness of sins through the blood of Jesus that is an anchor for our soul, that is sure and steadfast. Notice what it says there, that it cannot break down under whoever steps out upon it. Come on, this hope is when it doesn't matter how bad you were, how messed up your life is, how much sin you're in that you need to be delivered from and forgiveness from. It doesn't matter what your past, your background, the abuse you suffered, the things you've done. It does not matter. It cannot break. Amen? Come on, that's the hope that we have. And it's anchored in the presence of God. It's anchored in the throne room of God. It is anchored in the veil, in the very throne room of grace where Jesus has entered in for us in advance. The message translation says it this way. It says, we who've run for our very lives to God have every reason to grab the promise. Oh, the promised hope with both hands and never let go. It's an unbreakable spiritual lifeline reaching past all appearances right to the very presence of God where Jesus running on ahead of us has taken his permanent post as high priest for us. Come on, Jesus is our permanent high priest. It's his permanent post. 
He stands as high priest between us and God. You don't need a man. You don't need an intermediary. You can go straight to Jesus. He is your high priest, and it's an unbreakable spiritual lifeline. I, I remember at one time I was going uh, mountain climbing. I was a, a young, I was a teenager. I was at a camp, and we were going to climb this cliff face. And our guide, when we got there, he free climbed it. You know, he free climbed and just hooked in the little things as he went and set his anchor points. And when he got to the top, okay, what he did is then he anchored a rope and he brought it back down so that everybody could go up. Come on, this is what Jesus did. What you and I couldn't do, what you and I didn't have the strength and the skill and the ability well, to do for ourselves, Jesus went on first and he set an unbreakable spiritual lifeline that you can grab on with both hands and never let go. Never let go. And because of Jesus, because of his sacrifice, you and I have access to the throne of the very presence of the living God. And we have to go in. And we go in boldly. We go in boldly to get what? To get grace and mercy and strength and wisdom. James says, if you lack wisdom, ask of him who upbraideth not. Okay, so you can go into the throne room of God and say, God, I need wisdom. I need wisdom on how to minister to my family. I need wisdom on how to witness to this person on the job. I need wisdom on how to deal with my teenager in this area. I need wisdom in this. And this, it says he upbraideth not. He doesn't make you feel stupid. He doesn't ridicule you. He doesn't belittle you. He gives it freely. Why? Because you can come boldly before the throne and ask for what you need. How do we do this? We've got to learn to go in and to come out. First time this jumped out to me was in the story of Solomon in 1 Kings chapter 3. David has died. Solomon has become king. And, and God appears to Solomon in a dream. And Solomon says, you were good to my father, David. You were faithful to him. And now you've made me king. Verse 7. And now, O Lord my God, you have made your servant king instead of David my father. And I am but a little child. I know not how to go out or to come in. He says, I don't know how to go out or to come in. I don't know how to do what I have to do. See, Solomon is now responsible. He's king. All this weight is put on his shoulders, all this responsibility. Anybody remember when you became a parent and that weight hits you like a ton of bricks of like, wow, I'm responsible for another human being. <laughs> that they eat and bathe and survive and then learn to love God. Like, come on, like, like. Like, in this weight hit Solomon, and he says, I don't know what to do. But guess what? He went to where? The throne of grace. He said, Lord, I need wisdom. God said, ask whatever you want. And he said, give me wisdom. That's what I need. I need wisdom on how to do what you've called me to do. I don't need wealth. I don't need might. I, don't need, I need wisdom on how to do what I've been called to do. This idea of going in and out, the first place that I find that we can really see it is in Exodus chapter 33. And in Exodus 33, Moses has just come down from the mountain, okay? When he got down from the mountain, he finds the children of Israel. They've made a golden calf, and they're worshiping idols. Come on. Like... This is the same people that saw the plagues of Egypt, that saw the Red Sea split in two, that have a cloud over them in the day and a fire over them at night. And it takes 40 days for them to lose everything and go back to idolatry. And what Moses does, it says he takes the tabernacle. Scholars say that that really just means his own tent. That he took his own tent and he went outside of the camp and he sat it down and he went in and the presence of God came down. Why? Because hey, you gotta, when you got to lead people, Pastor Trey was bragging on you guys, and I've seen y'all this morning, okay, that you're hungry people. Well, when you got to lead people, that 40 days after the man of God goes to go meet with the Lord, and all the stuff they've seen are going to turn back to idolatry. Come on. Moses was like, I need help. I need help. Some of you need to realize prayer is not the King James Bible lingo. Like, it doesn't have to be, oh, Father, that our hollow it, it, it just talk to him thank you lord one of my favorite prayers i told our church this anybody can pray this anybody can pray this sometimes you just have to be like help help lord just look up i look to the hills from whence my help comes from help help i need it i need it to come now all right? And so don't get hung up on, I can't pray as good as sister so-and-so. Every church has a sister so-and-so. 
That little lady intercessor, she lit, and you're like, and don't compare yourself to her. Just pray. Just pray. Just talk to him. In, uh, in Numbers chapter 27, Moses speaking to the Lord says this. He said, let the Lord, the God of the spirits of all flesh, set a man over the congregation, which may go out before them, and which may go in before them, and which may lead them out, and which may bring them in, that the congregation of the Lord be not as sheep that have no shepherd. In other words, you have to learn, you have to be led, you have to go into the presence of God to receive direction from God, power from God, wisdom from God, favor from God, the anointing from God, come on, to go out. Come on, I know enough about this church to know that you're, you want to see the island come to know Jesus, okay? So to go out, we have to come in. Now, we can't stay in, okay? You can't bring your pillow and live in church because it's easy to worship God when the worship team is up here and they're killing it and they're doing awesome and they're leading you right in. That No, no, you have to learn to go in. Come on, it's easy on Sunday. You ever on Sunday morning after church, but I could take on the world. I'm ready to do something for Jesus. The problem is Sunday afternoons, we normally have a nap scheduled and nothing else. Okay, so you got to learn on Monday morning how to go into the presence and get filled up so that you can lead and go out and do something for the Lord. In Deuteronomy chapter 31, it says, and he said unto them, this is Moses talking to the people. He says, I am 120 years old this day. I can no more go out and come in. And the Lord has said unto me, you shall not go over the Jordan. So Moses says, I'm 120, I'm too old. So if you're under 120, you have not met the standard yet. Okay? If you hit 120, you can be like, Lord, I'm too old. Come get me. I'm done. Okay? I'm out. I want to go to heaven. I'm tired. Right, but if you're under 120, I'm sorry. That doesn't apply to you yet. Um, and so Moses says, I can no more go out and come in. Let's look at Joshua chapter 14. Start setting this up in Joshua chapter 14, the children of Israel, Moses has died. Joshua is leading the people. They have went into the promised land. They have been fighting their enemies for about four years. They have been wiping people out. They have been vanquishing their foes. They have been taking what God promised them, Right? Come on, how many of you want to be on that side of things? Come on, like, let's take what God has promised us. Let's see the promises of God manifesting in our lives, in our families, in our church, in our city, in our community. And so what happens in Joshua chapter 14 is Caleb comes to Joshua and he says, And Moses swear on that day, saying, Surely the land where your feet have trodden shall be your inheritance and your children's forever, because you have wholly followed the Lord your God. And now, behold, the Lord has kept me alive. Come on. Now, behold, the Lord has kept me alive. Some of you need to realize that you're not too old. The Lord has kept you alive for a purpose and a reason to do something for his kingdom. And he says, behold, the Lord has kept me alive. He has kept me alive. These 40 and 5 years, ever since the Lord spake the word to Moses, while the children of Israel wandered in the wilderness, and now, lo, I am this day four score and five years old. He's 85. Amen? Praise the Lord. So 85, you are in just the right age to take what God promised you a long time ago. Come on. Some of you, don't give up. Don't give up. Some of you are just getting to the age where it's time to take what was promised to you 45 years ago. And Caleb says to Joshua, verse 11, And yet I am as strong this day as I was in the day that Moses sent me. I haven't lost a step. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not slowing down. I'm not weaker than I was. I'm not anything less than I was. I am just as strong then as I am now. And what does he say? As my strength was then, even so is my strength now for war, both to go out and to come in. Now, therefore, give me this mountain. Come on. Come on. Some of you need to recognize the Lord has kept you alive for this. Oh, come on. To tell, and you better just start saying, give me my mountain. Come on. Give me my mountain. Give me my lost loved one. Give me that breakthrough. Give me that deliverance. Give me that miracle. Give me my mountain. 
He said, I'm still just as strong to go out and to come in. I haven't lost it. I haven't lost a thing. I'm ready to go. How do we go in? How do we go in? How do we go into the presence of the Lord? Well, you've already done it this morning, but I just want to highlight what you did. Psalm 100 verse 1. Make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all ye lands. Come on, no, come on, come on. This is the 11 o'clock service. Make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all ye lands. There we go. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. Know that he is God. He made us, not ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Verse 4. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Be thankful unto him and bless his name. How do we come in? Right there. That's how we come in. We enter into his gates with thanksgiving. We enter into his courts with praise. We're thankful and we bless his name. You do not need a band to do that. Come on, you do not need anointed worship leaders. They make it way easier. You've got to learn to get in your car and shut the door and begin to enter into his courts with thanksgiving and his gates with praise. To go into your living room, your closet, whatever, wherever you meet with God, that you go in and you enter in. Thank you, Lord. For your mercy is new every morning. Thank you, Lord, for your faithfulness to me. Thank you, Lord, for your blood that washes and cleanses. Thank you, Lord, I've been set free and delivered. I thank you, Lord, that sin has no power over me. I thank you, Lord, that I am washed. I am righteous. I am full of the Holy Ghost. Come on, you begin to thank him. I praise your name that you are worthy. You are majestic. You are magnificent. You are the great God, the righteous king. Come on, you go in. That's how we go into his presence. Verse 5, tying back to Hebrews, we come boldly before the throne of grace that we may obtain grace and mercy when we need it most. Verse 5 of Psalm 100. Oh, for the Lord is good and his mercy is everlasting and his truth endures to all generations. Come on, where we're going into the courts of God is into the courts of one whose mercy is everlasting and who is good and his truth endures to all generations. Come on, you're not going into, you ever been somewhere and you go to get some food and there's not much left. And you're like, oh, well, there's a little bit of this left. And you're scraping the bottom to get you some. Listen, when you go into the throne room of grace, there is never a diminished amount of mercy available to you. We've got to learn to go in. We have to learn to go in. Listen, the one thing that I'll tell you is that you will never get dragged in. Come on, come on. I've been pastoring and in ministry, and I've tried to drag some people in. It doesn't work. You can drag them to church, but you can't make them step into the presence. Come on, keep dragging your kids to church, though, and one day, oh, by God, they'll step in. Leonard Ravenhill said this. He said, to be much for God, we must be much with God. To be much for God, we must be much with God. If we want to be much for God when we go outside the walls of this house, if we want to be much for God when we leave our homes, when we come out of our prayer times, we must be much with him. To be much for God, we must be much with him. E.W. Kenyon said that the call to prayer is the Father's invitation to visit with him. The call to prayer is the Father's invitation. Come and commune with me and my son. Come and abide with us. Come and know us. Come and dwell with us. Come and commune with us. Come on, come and talk with us like you're talking to a friend, like you're talking to someone you love. Come and commune with him. We're going to see in the New Testament that Jesus lived out this in and out lifestyle. And if Jesus had to learn to go into the presence, to go into the throne room, to go out and do ministry, who do we think we are if we think we can just bypass that part? Come on, you have nothing to give if you haven't been with him. Come on, you have nothing to give if you haven't been with him. Come on, what did it say? It said about the disciples, they took note that they had been with Jesus. If we want to have something to give, we have to go in. We have to go into his presence. Matthew chapter 6, verse 6. But you, when you pray, enter your closet. When you've shut the door, pray to the Father which is in secret, and the Father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. Come on, you're going to have to go somewhere and shut the door. 
You have to shut out the distraction, shut, shut out the noise. Listen, that might be your car door. That may be the bathroom stall door at work. But you got to go somewhere and shut the door. And it doesn't, you don't have to have 30 minutes for a prayer time. It may be your bathroom break in the stall door. Like, Lord, I need mercy. I need grace. I need help. I need wisdom today. Like, I know, you've, I know you brought this person all oh, into my life for me to minister grace and truth to them. Oh, but I don't know what to say. Lord, put your words in my mouth. Put truth in my mouth. Put your words upon my tongue. Lord, would you use me? Help me not to say something, oh, that would turn them away from you. Oh, but that everything I say be seasoned with salt and grace and truth. Luke chapter 5, verse 15. Oh, but so much the more when there went fame abroad of him. Oh, and the great multitudes came together to hear and be healed by him of their infirmities. And he withdrew himself into the wilderness and prayed. Come on, where does Jesus do? After he's done ministering, he withdraws to the wilderness to pray. Matthew 14, verse 22, and straightway Jesus constrained his disciples to get into a ship and go before him to the other side. And while he sent them away, when he had sent them away, he went up into a mountain apart to pray. And when evening was come, he was there alone. Mark 135, and in the morning, rising a great while before day, he went out and departed into a solitary place and there prayed. Luke 6, 12, and it came to pass in those days, he went out into a mountain to pray and continued all night in prayer to God. Luke 9, 28, and it came to pass about eight days after these sayings, he took Peter and John and James and went up into a mountain to pray. Come on, prayer was a part of the lifestyle of Jesus. Getting away from the noise, getting away from the demands, getting away from even ministry to be with the Father and commune with Him was a part of His lifestyle. Come on, if you've been, it, it, those of you who've been serving God a long time, you know when you feel yourself like just struggling and dry and like there's nothing in you to give and you stop and you look and examine your own life, you're like, man, I've gotten really busy. I've gotten really busy. I've really been neglecting that secret place time. I've really been neglecting that getting away, that Sabbath rest, that being with the Lord, that going into his presence, that seeking his face, that going boldly before him and being with him so that I can get filled up. And so at church, it is something we have to do. It is something we have to do intentionally. It is something we have to do purposefully. Because why? If not, we'll have nothing to give. And the world, the world needs a church that is full of something to give, not an empty church. Come on. God doesn't want to just fill you up with enough to get you through. He wants to fill you up with enough grace and mercy and strength and joy that it can be poured out on people around you. Prayer was a part of the lifestyle of Jesus. And that's why we have in Luke chapter 11, verse 1, the disciples ask him, Lord, teach us to pray. Teach us to pray. They've been watching him do miracles. They've seen the dead raised. They've seen the 5,000 fed. They've seen all kinds of great things. They've watched him preach. They've watched him teach. And what do they say? They say, Lord, teach us to pray. Teach us to pray. In other words, it's one of those things. That you, you can watch someone that's trying to show you how to do something, and you watch him, and you're like, okay, I saw you do it, but I don't get how you did it. Show me again. And you watch him and you're like, I, 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 I'm seeing the result, but I'm not understanding what's going on in the process. And so, you know, and this is where I feel like the disciples were like, we've seen you pray. We know that's the power behind everything. Teach us how to do that. Teach us how to pray. And that may be your first prayer. Lord, teach me to pray. Teach me how to pray. I don't know how to pray. Like Solomon, I don't know how to go in. I don't know how to come out. I don't know how to do this thing. Lord, teach me to pray. Jesus told his disciples, this is right before his ascension, so Jesus, this is after the crucifixion, after the resurrection, 40 days of ministry in his glorified body, and then Jesus tells his disciples in Luke chapter 24, behold, I send the promise of my father upon you, but tarry in the city of Jerusalem until you be endued with power from on high. Now, what is this power? Acts 1.8 tells us, it says, But you shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And you shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in Judea and in Samaria and to the uttermost parts of the earth. Come on, it's power. The power of the Holy Ghost is to be a witness for Jesus wherever you go. 
He started with Jerusalem for them. That's where they were at. He says that it's the power for you to be a witness in, on the island. Come on, in Galveston, in the county, in the region, in the state of Texas, and to the uttermost parts of the earth. But what does he tell them to do? Go in and wait. Go in and wait. You need to go in, go into the presence, and wait until you receive the power of the Holy Spirit. Come on, we have to get something on the inside of us to have something to give when we go out. Jude chapter, uh, Jude verse 20 says, uh, that we are to stir up the gift of God by praying in the Holy Ghost. Come on, there's a gift on the inside of you when you're born again, but it's got to get stirred up. It's got to get built up. We build ourselves up praying in the Holy Ghost. We build ourselves up in the secret place, spending time with him, getting in his word, knowing more about him, so that when you go out there, you look like him. Oh, that they would take note of us that we've been with Jesus. Oh, the thing I pray the most when I go into a time of prayer is, Lord, make me more like you. Make me more like you. I want to be like you. Like, why? Because my compassion runs out. But his doesn't. You need his compassion for people. Oh, you need his passion for the lost. Oh, you need his heart for those lost loved ones. You might be tired and just burned out of dealing with your loved ones who are stubborn and resisting the gospel. Oh, but guess what? God's grace and mercy can give you a heart that is unwavering in its love and its passion for them. <laughs> Colossians chapter 4 verse 2. The apostle Paul admonishes us this is out of the voice translation he says pray and keep praying be alert and thankful when you pray be alert and thankful this is how we come in with thanksgiving with praise and while you're at it add to us to your prayers pray that God here's something we need to pray this is something we all need to pray all the time pray that God would open doors and windows and minds and eyes and hearts for the word so we can go on telling the mystery of the anointed. Come on. We need to be praying that eyes and hearts and minds would be open to hear the good news. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 18, he says, pray always, pray in the spirit, pray about everything in every way you know how, and keeping all this in mind, pray on behalf of God's people, pray feverishly. He says in verse 19, please pray for me, pray that truth will be with me before I even open my mouth. Ask the spirit to guide me while I boldly defend the mystery that is the good news. Come on, he says, this is the Apostle Paul. If the Apostle Paul says he needs prayer, that the truth would be with him when he opens his mouth, that the Spirit would guide him wherever he goes, and that he would bravely pronounce the truth, so do you and I. Come on, we need prayer. We need to pray, Lord, let your truth be in my mouth as soon as I open it. Lord, let me boldly to proclaim and declare your truth. Lord, let the Spirit guide me in every conversation, in every situation, that you would be glorified and that all eyes would turn to you. Come on, this is what we need to pray. Praying always. Pray in the Spirit. Pray about everything in every way you know how. Come on. It's not about, I said earlier, it's not about you praying like sister so-and-so. Pray in every way you know how. Just start. Just start communing with God. Start talking with him. Start stepping in and pushing into his presence. I want to give you two quotes as I close. Ian Bounds said this. He said, the kingdom of God waits on prayer. And prayer puts wings on the gospel and power into it. By prayer, it moves forward with conquering force and rapid advance. Prayer puts wings on the gospel. Prayer puts wings on the gospel. And so what prayer does is prayer makes our efforts at witness and outreach and evangelism go further and faster than they could ever go with just us. Prayer puts wings on the gospel and it causes it to advance, oh, rapidly and conquer Samuel Chadwick said this. He said, the one concern of the devil is to keep saints from prayer. He fears nothing from prayerless studies, prayerless work, or prayerless religion. He laughs at our toil, mocks at our wisdom, but trembles when we pray. Come on, the enemy trembles when we pray. 
You want to see the enemy tremble in your life, and your community? Oh, we have to be people of prayer. We have to learn how to go into the presence, to the throne room of God, so that we can get filled up with something, so that we can have the power to go out and be a witness everywhere that we go. If you'd stand to your feet and pastor, whoever's supposed to come, I just want to pray a general prayer over everyone and over this house. Father, I thank you for this house. I thank you for Church of the Living God. I thank you for the heart they have to see Galveston reach with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I thank you, Lord, that you would draw every man, every woman, every young person into your presence, that they would boldly approach your throne of grace, knowing that the righteous scepter has been extended to them, and they can ask for everything they need, that they may have the power and the wisdom to be a witness all over the island and in every community they touch and in their families and on their jobs, that they would see the goodness of God manifest through them to the world around them. I thank you, Lord, that they would come in and they would go out with power in a new level, in a new dimension, and that they would see all of the promises that they have. Oh, for this region, for this city, I thank you that the vision that Galveston, that the island would be flooded with the name of Jesus, that the water is rising to a new height. Oh, that the glory is coming to a new level and many 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 more families would come into the kingdom of God in the coming days I thank you Lord in Jesus name amen